Breaking Bad is an American neo-Western crime drama television series created and produced by Vince Gilligan. The show aired on AMC from January 20, 2008, to September 29, 2013, consisting of five seasons for a total of 62 episodes. It was set and filmed in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and tells the story of Walter White, an underpaid, overqualified, and dispirited high school chemistry teacher who is struggling with a recent diagnosis of stage 3 lung cancer. Walter turns to a life of crime, partnering with his former student Jesse Pinkman, by producing and distributing crystal meth to secure his family's financial future before he dies, while navigating the dangers of the criminal underworld. According to Gilligan, the title is a southern colloquialism meaning to raise hell. Among the show's co-stars are Anna Gunn and R.J. Mitter as Walter's wife Skylar and son Walter Jr., and Betsy Brandt and Dean Norris as Skylar's sister Marie Schrader, and her husband Hank, a DEA agent. Others include Bob Odenkirk as Walter's and Jesse's sleazy lawyer Saul Goodman, Jonathan Banks as private investigator and fixer Mike Ehrmantraut, and Giancarlo Esposito as drug kingpin Gus Fring. The final season introduces Jesse Plemons as the criminally ambitious Todd Alquist, and Laura Fraser as Lydia Rhoda Quayle, a cunning business executive secretly managing Walter's global meth sales for her company. Breaking Bad's first season received generally positive reviews, while the rest of its run received unanimous critical acclaim. Since its conclusion, the show has been lauded by critics as one of the greatest television series of all time. It had fair viewership in its first three seasons, but the fourth and fifth seasons saw a moderate rise in viewership when it was made available on Netflix just before the fourth season premiere. Viewership increased more drastically upon the premiere of the second half of the fifth season in 2013. By the time that the series finale aired, it was among the most watched cable shows on American television. The show received numerous awards, including 16 Primetime Emmy Awards, 8 Satellite Awards, 2 Golden Globe Awards, 2 Peabody Awards, 2 Critics' Choice Awards, and 4 Television Critics' Association Awards. Cranston won the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series four times, while Aaron Paul won the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Drama Series three times, Anna Gunn won the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Drama Series twice. In 2013, Breaking Bad entered the Guinness World Records as the most critically acclaimed TV show of all time. Better Call Saul, a prequel series featuring Odenkirk, Banks, and Esposito reprising their Breaking Bad roles, debuted on AMC on February 8, 2015, and has been renewed for a final sixth season. The sequel film El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie starring Paul was released on Netflix and in theaters on October 11, 2019. Chapter 1, Premise Set in Albuquerque, New Mexico, between 2008 and 2010, Breaking Bad follows Walter White, a meek high school chemistry teacher who transforms into a ruthless player in the local methamphetamine drug trade, driven by a desire to financially provide for his family after being diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. Initially making only small batches of meth with his former student Jesse Pinkman in a rolling meth lab, Walter and Jesse eventually expand to make larger batches of a special blue meth that is incredibly pure and creates high demand. Walter takes on the name Heisenberg to mask his identity. Because of his drug-related activities, Walter eventually finds himself at odds with his family, the Drug Enforcement Administration through his brother-in-law Hank Schrader, the local gangs, and the Mexican drug cartels, putting him and his family's lives at risk. Chapter 2 – Production Chapter 2 – Section 1 – Conception Breaking Bad was created by Vince Gilligan, who spent several years writing the Fox series The X-Files. Gilligan wanted to create a series in which the protagonist became the antagonist. Television is historically good at keeping its characters in a self-imposed stasis so that shows can go on for years or even decades, he said. When I realized this, the logical next step was to think, how can I do a show in which the fundamental drive is toward change? 
He added that his goal with Walter White was to turn him from Mr. Chips into Scarface. Gilligan believed the concept of showing the full drastic transformation of a character across the run of a television show was a risky concept and would be difficult to pitch without other powerful factors to support it, such as strong cinematography and acting. The show title is a southern colloquialism meaning, among other things, raising hell, and was chosen by Gilligan to describe Walter's transformation. According to Time Entertainment editor Lily Rothman, the term has a broader meaning and is an old phrase which connotes more violence than raising hell does, he words possess a wide variety of nuances, to break bad can mean to go wild, to defy authority, and break the law, to be verbally combative, belligerent, or threatening or, followed by the preposition on, to dominate or humiliate. The concept emerged as Gilligan talked with his fellow X-Files writer Thomas Shouse regarding their current unemployment, and joked that the solution was for them to put a meth lab in the back of an RV and around the country cooking meth and making money. After writing the concept for the show and pilot, Gilligan pitched it to Sony Pictures Television, who became very interested in supporting it. Sony arranged for meetings with the various cable networks. Showtime passed on this, as they had already started broadcasting Weeds, a show with similarities to the premise of Breaking Bad. While his producers convinced him that the show was different enough to still be successful, Gilligan later stated that he would not have gone forward with the idea had he known about Weeds earlier. Other networks like HBO and TNT also passed on the idea, but eventually FX took interest and began initial discussions on producing the pilot. At the same time, FX had also started development of Dirt, a female-centric crime-based drama series, and with three existing male-centric shows already on the network, FX passed up Breaking Bad for Dirt. One of Gilligan's agents spoke to Jeremy Elise, the director of original programming for AMC who was looking for more original shows to add alongside their upcoming Mad Men. Elise was intrigued, and soon a meeting was set up between Gilligan, Elise, and two programming executives. Gilligan was not optimistic about this meeting, fearing they would just put him off, but instead all three showed great interest, and the meeting ended up establishing how AMC would acquire the rights from FX and set the pilot into production. It took about a year following this meeting before Sony had set up the rights with AMC and production could start. Chapter 2 Section 2 Development History the network ordered nine episodes for the first season, but the 2007 08 Writers Guild of America strike limited the production to seven episodes, as well as delaying the start of production for the second season. Within the original nine episode arc, Gilligan had planned to kill off Jesse or Hank, as a ballsy moment to end the season on. This death was eliminated with the limited episode count which Gilligan found to be a net positive given the strength of acting that both Paul and Norris brought to these roles through the seasons. The strike also helped to slow down production long enough for Gilligan, and his writing team to readjust the pacing of the show, which in the original arc had been moving too quickly. Gould stated that the writer's strike saved the show, as if they had produced the two additional episodes in the first season, they would have gone down a different creative path that he believes would have led to the show's cancellation by its third season. The initial versions of the script were set in Riverside, California, but at the suggestion of Sony, Albuquerque was chosen for the production's location due to the favorable financial conditions offered by the state of New Mexico. Once Gilligan recognized that this would mean we'd always have to be avoiding the Sandia Mountains in shots directed toward the east, the story setting was changed to the actual production location. It was shot primarily on 35mm film, with digital cameras employed as needed for additional angles, point-of-view shots and time-lapse photography. Breaking Bad cost $3 million per episode to produce, higher than the average cost for a basic cable program. Around 2010, AMC had expressed to Sony Pictures Television and Gilligan, that they felt that the third season would be the last for Breaking Bad. Sony started to shop the show around, having gained quick interest from the FX network for two more seasons, upon which AMC changed its mind and allowed the show to continue. At the same time, Netflix was starting to aggressively shop for content to add to its service, 
and arranged a deal with Sony for Breaking Bad to be available after the airing of the fourth season. However, knowing that AMC had placed Breaking Bad on a potential cancellation route, Sony pushed to have the show added to the service in time for the fourth season. Because of this, Breaking Bad's viewership grew greatly as viewers binged the series on Netflix, helping to assure that a fifth season could be made. The fifth season premiere had more than double the viewership compared to the fourth season premiere, attributed to the Netflix availability. Gilligan thanked Netflix at the Emmy Awards in September 2013 after the series' conclusion for the popularity of the series, saying that Netflix kept us on the air. As the series progressed, Gilligan and the writing staff of Breaking Bad made Walter increasingly unsympathetic. Gilligan said during the run of the series, he's going from being a protagonist to an antagonist. We want to make people question who they're pulling for, and why, Cranston said by the fourth season, I think Walt's figured out it's better to be a pursuer than the pursued. He's well on his way to badass. In July 2011, Vince Gilligan indicated that he intended to conclude Breaking Bad at the end of its fifth season. In early August, 2011, negotiations began over a deal regarding the fifth and possible final season between the network AMC and Sony Pictures Television, the production company of the series. AMC proposed a shortened fifth season to cut costs, but the producers declined. Sony then approached other cable networks about possibly picking up the show if a deal could not be made. On August 14, 2011, AMC renewed the series for a fifth and final season consisting of 16 episodes. However, in April 2012, Brian Cranston revealed that the fifth season would be split into two halves, with the first eight episodes airing in 2012, and the final eight in 2013. Before the series finale, Gilligan said that it was difficult to write for Walter White because the character was so dark and morally questionable, I'm going to miss the show when it's over, but on some level, it'll be a relief to not have Walt in my head anymore. Gilligan later said the idea for Walter's character intrigued him so much that he didn't really give much thought on how well it would sell, stating that he would have given up on the premise since it was such an odd, dark story that could have difficulties being pitched to studios. Ultimately, Gilligan chose to end Breaking Bad with Walter's death, occurring in story two years after he had been first been diagnosed with cancer and given two years to live. Gilligan said by the end of the series, it feels as if we should adhere to our promise that we explicitly made to our audience from the first episode. Chapter 2 Section 3 Casting Breaking Bad creator Vince Gilligan cast Brian Cranston for the role of Walter White based on having worked with him in the Drive episode of the science fiction television series The X-Files, on which Gilligan worked as a writer. Cranston played an anti-Semite with a terminal illness who took series co-protagonist Fox Mulder hostage. Gilligan said the character had to be simultaneously loathsome and sympathetic, and that Brian alone was the only actor who could do that, who could pull off that trick and it is a trick. I have no idea how he does it. AMC officials, who were initially reluctant with the casting choice, having known Cranston only as the over-the-top character Hal on the comedy series Malcolm in the Middle, approached actors John Cusack and Matthew Broderick about the role. When both actors declined, the executives were persuaded to cast Cranston after seeing his X-Files episode. Cranston contributed significantly to the formation and development of the Walter White persona. When Gilligan left much of Walter's past unexplained during the development of the series, the actor wrote his own backstory for the character. At the start of the show, Cranston gained ten pounds to reflect the character's personal decline, and had the natural red highlights of his hair dyed brown. He collaborated with costume designer Kathleen de Toro on a wardrobe of mostly neutral green and brown colors to make the character bland and unremarkable, and worked with makeup artist Frida Valenzuela to create a mustache he described as impotent and like a dead caterpillar. Cranston repeatedly identified elements in certain scripts where he disagreed with how the character was handled, and went so far as to call Gilligan directly when he could not work out disagreements with the episode's screenwriters. Cranston has said he was inspired partially by his elderly father for how Walter carries himself physically, 
which he described as a little hunched over, never erect, the weight of the world is on this man's shoulders. In contrast to his character, Cranston has been described as extremely playful on set, with Aaron Paul describing him as a kid trapped in a man's body. Aaron Paul's casting was also initially questioned by production, as Paul looked too old and, too much like a pretty boy to be associated with meth cooking. However, Gilligan reconsidered Paul's skills after seeing his audition and recalling he had also had guest starred on the X-Files episode Lord of the Flies. Gilligan originally intended for Pinkman to be killed at the end of Breaking Bad's first season in a botched, drug deal as a plot device to plague Walter White with guilt. However, Gilligan said by the second episode of the season, he was so impressed with Paul's performance that it became pretty clear early on that would be a huge, colossal mistake, to kill off Jesse. Similarly, Dean Norris had shown his ability to be a law enforcement official in the X-Files episode F. Masculotter, and was brought on to be Hank Schrader, Walter's brother-in-law, and DEA agent. Chapter 2 Section 4, Scientific Accuracy Donna Nelson, a professor of organic chemistry at the University of Oklahoma, checked scripts and provided dialogue. She also drew chemical structures and wrote chemical equations which were used as props. According to creator Vince Gilligan, Dr. Donna Nelson from the University of Oklahoma approached us several seasons back and said, I really like this show, and if you ever need help with the chemistry, I'd love to lend a hand. She's been a wonderful advisor. We get help wherever we need it, whether it's chemistry, electrical engineering, or physics. We try to get everything correct. There's no full time on set, but we run certain scenes by these experts first. Because Walter White was talking to his students, I was able to dumb down certain moments of description and dialogue in the early episodes which held me until we had some help from some honest-to-God chemists says Gilligan. According to Gilligan, Nelson vets our scripts to make sure our chemistry dialogue is accurate and up-to-date. We also have a chemist with the Drug Enforcement Administration based out of Dallas who has just been hugely helpful to us. Nelson spoke of Gilligan's interest in having the science right, saying that Gilligan said it made a difference to him. Several episodes of Mythbusters featured attempts to validate or disprove scenes from Breaking Bad, often with Gilligan guest starring in the episode to participate. In 2013, two scenes from the first season of Breaking Bad were put under scrutiny in a Mythbusters Breaking Bad special. Despite several modifications to what was seen in the show, both the scenes depicted in the show were shown to be physically impossible. It was shown impossible to use hydrofluoric acid to fully dissolve metal, flesh, or ceramic as shown in the episode Cats in the Bag, and that while it was possible to throw fulminated mercury against the floor to cause an explosion, as in the episode Crazy Handful of Nothing, Walter would have needed a much larger quantity of the compound and thrown at a much faster speed, and likely would have killed all in the room. A later Mythbusters episode, Blow It Out of the Water, tested the possibility of mounting an automated machine gun in a car as in the series finale Felina, and found it plausible. An episode of Mythbusters Jr. proved that it was impossible for an electromagnet to draw metallic objects from across a room as in the episode Live Free or Die. Jason Wallach of Vice magazine commended the accuracy of the cooking methods presented in the series. In early episodes, a once common clandestine method, the Nagai Red Phosphorus slash Iodine method, is depicted, which uses pseudoephedrine as a precursor to D-methamphetamine. By the season 1 finale, Walt chooses to use a different synthetic route based on the difficulty of acquiring enough pseudoephedrine to produce on the larger scale required. The new method Walt chooses is a reductive amination reaction, relying on phenyl 2 propanon and methylamine. On the show, the phenyl 2 propanon is produced from phenylacetic acid, and acetic acid using a tube furnace and thorium dioxide as a catalyst as mentioned in episodes A No Rough Stuff Type Deal and Mass. Peer-to-peer -peer and methylamine form an imin intermediate, reduction of this peer-to-peer -peer methylamine imin intermediate is performed using mercury-aluminium amalgam, as shown in several episodes, including Hazard Pay. 
One of the important plot points in the series is that the crystal meth Walter Cooks has very long crystals, is very pure, and has a strong cyan blue color. Truly ultra pure crystal meth would tend to be clear or white. In their article Die Chemie Bay Breaking Bad on Chemie in Umzerazite, Tunga Salt Hammer and Fork Harnish discuss the plausibility of the chemistry portrayed in certain scenes. According to the two, chemistry is clearly depicted as a manufacturing science without much explanation of analytical methods being provided. On the other hand, Serious scientific subjects are mixed into the dialogue in order to show a world where chemistry plays a key role. Chapter 2 Section 5 Technical Aspects Michael Slavis was the cinematographer of Breaking Bad, beginning with the second season, and he received critical acclaim for his work throughout the series. Critics appreciated the bold visual style adopted by the TV series. Although series creator Vince Gilligan and Slavis wanted to shoot Breaking Bad in CinemaScope, Sony and AMC did not grant them permission. Gilligan cited Sergio Leone's westerns as a reference for how he wanted the series to look. Slavis received four Primetime Emmy Award nominations for Outstanding Cinematography for a one-hour series and Outstanding Cinematography for a single-camera series. Breaking Bad was shot on 35mm movie film because of the robustness of the equipment, and to keep a focus on shooting scenes economically. It also allowed for a later digital transfer to 4K Ultra HD resolution. By the end of the fifth season, Episodes had cost upwards of six million U.S. dollars to produce. Kelly Dixon was one of the few editors of Breaking Bad and edited many of the series' meth montages. For the montages, she would use techniques such as jump cuts and alternating the speed of the film, either faster or slower. For her work, she received six Primetime Emmy Award nominations for Outstanding Single Camera Picture Editing for a Drama Series and won the award in 2013. Chapter 3, Cast and Characters Chapter 3 Section 1, Main Characters Brian Cranston as Walter White, a high school chemistry teacher who, shortly after his 50th birthday, is diagnosed with stage 3 lung cancer and turns to making meth to secure his family's finances. As his shady business progresses, Walter gains a notorious reputation under the alias of Heisenberg. Cranston stated that, though he enjoyed doing comedy, he decided he, should really focus on doing something else. But I think any good drama worth its weight always has a sprinkling of comedy in it, because you can ease the tension to an audience when it's necessary, and then build it back up again. Walt White has no clue he's occasionally funny, but as an actor, I recognize when there are comedic moments and opportunities. Anna Gunner's Skylar White, Walter's wife who was pregnant with their second child before his diagnosis, and who becomes increasingly suspicious of her husband after he begins behaving in unfamiliar ways. Gunn sees Skylar as grounded, tough, smart and driven. Gunn sees Skylar's stall writing career as her biggest dream, saying, I think she really deep down yearns to be an artist and to be creative and productive. Aaron Paul as Jesse Pinkman, Walter's cooking partner and former student. Paul sees Jesse as a funny kid. He's just this lost soul, I don't think he's a bad kid, he just got mixed in the wrong crowd. Paul elaborated on the character's background, saying, he doesn't come from an abusive, alcoholic background. But maybe he just didn't relate to his father, maybe his father was too strict and too proper for Jesse. Paul compared the character's relationship with Walt to the odd couple. Dean Norris as Hank Schrader, Marie's husband, Walter and Skylar's brother-in-law and a DEA agent. At the beginning of the series, Hank was intended to be the comic relief. Norris, who has played several policemen before in film and television, stated, Having played so many cops, I've talked with a lot of technical advisors, so I've been able to pick up a lot. Coincidentally, one of my best friends growing up is a cop in Chicago, and one of my other best friends out in LA is a sheriff. So I get to see all the components of that culture. Betsy Brandt as Marie Schrader, Skylar's sister and Hank's kleptomaniac wife. Brandt described Marie as an unpleasant bitch, 
but also stated there was more to her than that. I think we're seeing more of it now that she would be there for her family. But it's all about her. RJ Mitter's Walter White Jr., Walter and Skylar's son, who has cerebral palsy. He begins lashing out after Walter's cancer announcement. Like Walter Jr., Mitter has cerebral palsy, although his is a milder form. Mitter stated he had to regress from his therapy to portray the character, staying up late into the night to slur his speech and learning to walk on crutches, so his walking would not look fake. Giancarlo Esposito's Gustavo Gus Fring, a Chilean high-level drug distributor who has a cover as an owner of the fast-food chain Los Polos Hermanos. Esposito stated that for the third season, he incorporated his yoga training in his performance. Gus is the coolest cucumber that ever walked the earth. I think about Eddie Olmos way back in Miami Vice. He was like dead, he was hardly breathing. I thought, how is this guy just standing in this fire and doing nothing? Gus has totally allowed me that level of flexibility and relaxation, not because he has ultimate power and he knows he can take someone's life. He's just confident. Bob Odenkirk as Saul Goodman, a crooked strip mall lawyer who represents Walt and Jesse. Odenkirk drew inspiration for Goodman from film producer Robert Evans. I thought about Robert Evans because I've listened to The Kid Stays in the picture on CD. He's constantly switching up his cadence, and his delivery. He emphasizes interesting words. He has loads of attitude in almost every line that he says. So when I rehearse the scenes alone I do my impersonation of Robert Evans to find those moments and turns. Then I go out and I do Saul. Jonathan Banks as Mike Ehrmantraut, works for Gus as an all-purpose cleaner and hitman, and also works for Saul as a private investigator. The character of Mike has been compared to Harvey Keitel's Winston Wolfe character in Pulp Fiction, which Banks says he is not trying to emulate, I immediately tried to put it out of my mind, quite honestly. His cleaner ain't my cleaner. But throughout this world, you would suspect there had been a great many cleaners, whether government-run or individual contractors. Laura Fraser as Lydia Rhoda Quayle, a high-ranking employee of Madrigal Electromotive and a former associate of Gus Fring. She reluctantly begins supplying Walt and Jesse with methylamine and helps Walt expand his operation overseas. Jesse Plemons as Todd Alquist, an employee of Vamanos Pest Control who becomes an associate of Walt and Jesse. Chapter 3 Section 2 Recurring Characters Stephen Michael Quezada as Stephen Gomi Gomez, Hank's DEA partner and best friend who assists in tracking down and learning the identity of Heisenberg. In comical situations between him and Hank, Gomez serves as the straight man. Matt Jones as Brandon Badger Mayhew, Jesse's drug-addicted, dim-witted friend who often serves as the series' comic relief. Charles Baker as Skinny Pete, a friend of Jesse and a fellow pusher. Rodney Rush as Christian Combo Ortega, also a friend of Jesse and a fellow pusher. Jessica Hecht and Adam Godley as Gretchen and Elliot Schwartz, co-owners of Grey Matter, a company that they co-founded alongside Walter, who left the business prior to its major success. Gretchen was a former flame of Waltz and partially the reason he left. Raymond Cruz as Tuco Salamanca, a sociopathic Mexican drug kingpin who becomes Walt and Jesse's meth distributor. Mark Margolis as Hector Salamanca, a former high-ranking member of the Juarez cartel who is now unable to walk or speak because of a stroke, communicating with the help of a bell. He is the uncle of Tuco, Marco, and Lionel Salamanca. Christopher Cousins as Ted Benicky, Skylar's boss and president of Benicky Fabricators who begins developing financial issues, resulting in an intervention from Skylar. Kristen Ritter as Jane Margolis, Jesse's apartment manager and girlfriend, who is a recovering addict. John Delancey as Donald Margolis, Jane Margolis' father, an air traffic controller. David Costable as Gail Betica, a chemist hired by Gus Fring to work alongside Walter. Daniel Moncada and Luis Moncada as Lionel and Marco Salamanca, 
two ruthless and taciturn hitmen for the Juarez cartel who are the cousins of Tuco Salamanca, and the nephews of Hector Salamanca. Emily Rios as Andrea Contillo, Jesse's second girlfriend, who is also a recovering addict. She has a young son named Brock. Jeremiah Bitsu as Victor, a loyal henchman to Gus who serves as his enforcer along with Mike. Ray Campbell as Tyrus Kitt, Gus's enforcer along with Mike during season 4. Lavelle Crawford as Huel Babano, Saul's bodyguard who also handles problems Walter needs fixing. Tina Parker as Francesca Liddy, Saul Goodman's receptionist. Bill Burr as Patrick Kuby, a hired conman of Saul's who handles various sensitive tasks involving verbal intimidation, coercion, and misdirection. Michael Bowen as Jack Welker, Todd's uncle and the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood, a white supremacist gang. Kevin Rankin as Kenny, Jack's second-in-command. Chapter 3 Section 3 Special Guest Appearances Danny Trejo as Tortuga, a Mexican cartel member and DEA informant. DJ Qualls as Getz, an Albuquerque police officer who brings Badger into police custody, prompting Walt to turn to Saul Goodman. Jim Beaver as Lawson, an Albuquerque arms dealer who obtains several guns for Walt. Stephen Bauer as Don El Audio Viewant, the leader of the Juarez cartel who has a history with Gus. Robert Forster as Ed Galbraith, a vacuum cleaner repairman, whose undercover business is a new identity specialist. Charlie Rose as himself. Chapter 4 Episodes The complete series was released on DVD and Blu-ray on November 26, 2013, in a collectible box, shaped like one of the barrels used by Walt to bury his money. The set contains various features, including a two-hour documentary and a humorous alternative ending that features Cranston and his Malcolm in the Middle co-star Jane Kaczmarek playing their characters Hal and Lois, in a nod to the final scene from New Heart. Chapter 4 Section 1, Season 1 The first season was originally intended to be nine episodes, but due to the 2007-2008 Writers Guild of America strike only seven episodes were filmed. It ran from January 20 to March 9, 2008. Walter, diagnosed with inoperable lung cancer, conspires with Jesse to cook methamphetamine as a way to pay for his treatment and provide financial security for his family. Jesse secures a recreational vehicle to cook in, while Walter devises a production route using unregulated chemicals, creating a highly pure product, tinted blue. After a run-in with the Mexican drug cartel, Walter adopts the name Heisenberg, with his Blue Sky Meth his signature product. Hank and the DA become aware of this new figure in the drug trade and begin their investigation. Chapter 4 Section 2, Season 2 Jesse's dealers become unsafe, and Walter hires a corrupt lawyer Saul Goodman to connect them to a high-profile drug dealer Gus as a buyer for their latest batch. Jesse dates his apartment manager Jane, and she relapses on heroin, Jesse becomes unreliable. Walter refuses to pay him his half of the sale to Gus, but Jane blackmails Walter. Walter returns to Jesse to apologize, but allows an unconscious Jane to choke on her own vomit. With Jesse in rehab, Walter seems content until he witnesses a mid-air collision of two planes, a result of Jane's father, an air traffic controller, becoming distraught over her death while on the job. Chapter 4 Section 3, Season 3 On April 2, 2009, AMC announced that Breaking Bad was renewed for a third, 13-episode season. It premiered on March 21, 2010, and concluded on June 13, 2010. The complete third season was released on Region 1 DVD and Region A Blu-ray on June 7, 2011. Gus offers Walter a job cooking meth at a hidden lab. Walter demands Jesse to be his assistant rather than Gus's choice of Gale. Skylar learns of Walter's meth cooking and demands a divorce. Hank's investigation leads him to Jesse, but he finds no evidence and assaults Jesse, forcing him into a short leave. Hank is forewarned about an attack from two assassins and kills them, 
but he becomes paralyzed in the aftermath. Jesse's behavior becomes erratic, and Gus replaces him with Gale. Later, Walter fears Gus will kill him and Jesse once Gale learns enough about their methods, and instructs Jesse to kill Gale. Chapter 4 Section 4, Season 4 On June 14, 2010, AMC announced Breaking Bad was renewed for a fourth, 13-episode season. Production began in January 2011, the season premiered on July 17, 2011, and concluded on October 9, 2011. Originally, mini-episodes of four minutes in length were to be produced before the premiere of the fourth season, but these did not come to fruition. Gus tightens security at the lab after Gale's death. Gus and Mike work to drive a wedge between Walter and Jesse, seeking to coerce Jesse to be their solitary cook by capturing Walter while at the same time eliminating the Mexican cartel. Skylar accepts Walter's meth cooking, and works with Saul to launder his earnings. Hank, while recovering, tracks Gale's death to Gus and the drug trade. Gus releases Walter and plans to kill Hank. Walter tricks Jesse into turning against Gus, and convinces Hector Salamanca to detonate a pipe bomb, in the same room as Gus, killing them both. Chapter 4 Section 5, Season 5 On August 14, 2011, AMC announced that Breaking Bad was renewed for a fifth and final season consisting of 16 episodes. Season 5 is split into two parts, each consisting of eight episodes. The first half premiered on July 15, 2012, while the second half premiered on August 11, 2013. In August 2013, AMC released a trailer promoting the premiere of final season with Brian Cranston reading the poem Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley, over time-lapse shots of Breaking Bad locations. After Gus's death, Walter, Jesse, and Mike start a new meth business. When their accomplice Todd kills a child witness during their theft of methylamine, Jesse and Mike sell their share of the methylamine to Declan, another distributor. Walter produces meth for Declan, and Gus's former associate Lydia starts distribution in Europe, which is so successful that Walter earns 80 million US dollars, which he buries on the Tohadjili Indian reservation. After Walter kills Mike during an argument, Hank discovers Walter is Heisenberg and begins gathering evidence. Panicking, Walt hires Todd's Uncle Jack and his gang to kill Mike's associates and Jesse. Jack's gang turns on Walter, kills Declan and Hank, captures Jesse, and takes most of Walter's money. Walter uses the remainder to escape to New Hampshire. After months in hiding, Walter intends to surrender, but changes course after Elliot and Gretchen publicly minimize his involvement in starting Grey Matter. He leaves his money in a trust which he coerces Elliot and Gretchen to administer for his children. After poisoning Lydia, Walter confesses to Skylar that he manufactured methamphetamine for his own satisfaction rather than his family's financial security. At Jack's compound, Walter kills Jack and the rest of his gang with a remote-controlled machine gun and frees the imprisoned Jesse, who kills Todd. Wounded in the aftermath, Walter asks Jesse to kill him, but Jesse refuses. The two share a farewell glance, after which Jesse escapes. Walter reminisces in Jack's meth, lab and eventually dies. Chapter 5, Themes Chapter 5 Section 1 Moral Consequences. In an interview with the New York Times, creator Vince Gilligan said the larger lesson of the series is that actions have consequences. He elaborated on the show's philosophy. If religion is a reaction of man, and nothing more, it seems to me that it represents a human desire for wrongdoers to be punished. I hate the idea of Idi Amin living in Saudi Arabia for the last 25 years of his life. That galls me to no end. I feel some sort of need for biblical atonement, or justice, or something. I like to believe there is some comeuppance, that karma kicks in at some point, even if it takes years or decades to happen. My girlfriend says this great thing that's become my philosophy as well. I want to believe there's a heaven. But I can't not believe there's a hell. 
In a piece comparing the show to The Sopranos, Mad Men, and The Wire, Chuck Klosterman said that Breaking Bad is built on the uncomfortable premise that there's an irrefutable difference between what's right and what's wrong, and it's the only one where the characters have real control over how they choose to live. Klosterman added that the central question of Breaking Bad is, what makes a man bad dash his actions, his motives, or his conscious decision to be a bad person. Klosterman concluded that, in the world of Breaking Bad, goodness and badness are simply complicated choices, no different than anything else. Ross Douthat of the New York Times in a response to Klosterman's piece, compared Breaking Bad and The Sopranos, stating that both series are morality plays that are both interested in moral agency. Douthat went on to say that Walter White and Tony Soprano represent mirror image takes on the problem of evil, damnation, and free will. Walter is a man who deliberately abandons the light for the darkness while Tony is someone born and raised in darkness who turns down opportunity after opportunity to claw his way upward to the light. Chapter 5 Section 2 Devotion to Family The show explores most of the main characters' connections to their families in great detail. Walt justifies his decision to cook crystal meth and become a criminal because of his desire to provide for his family. In the third season he tries to exit the business because it has driven Skylar to leave him. Gus convinces him to stay, telling him it is a man's job to provide for his family, even if he is unloved. In the final episode of the series, however, Walt finally admits to Skylar that the main motivation for his endeavors in the meth business was his own interest, in spite of secretly securing the $9.72 million he had managed to salvage for her and the children. Jesse's loneliness in the early seasons of the show can be partly explained by his parents' decision to kick him out of their home due to his drug-related activities. This parental disconnect brings him closer to Jane, whose father berates her for her drug use. When Walt crosses paths with Jane's father, Walt refers to Jesse as his nephew and laments the fact that he cannot get through to him. Jane's father responds by telling him to keep trying, saying, family. You can't give up on them, ever. What else is there? Jane's subsequent death, which Walt purposefully did not prevent, is a major factor in her father causing the airliner crash at the end of the second season. Even the show's more hardened characters maintain ties to family. In the second season, Tuco Salamanca spends time caring for his physically disabled uncle, Hector. When Tuco is killed by Hank, his cousins vow revenge. Their actions are further explained in a flashback, where Hector explains to the brothers that La Familia es to do. Gustavo Fring's franchise Los Polos Hermanos translates to the Chicken Brothers. This refers to the fact that the company was co-founded by Gus and a man named Max, with whom he shared a close personal connection. When Max is killed by Hector Salamanca, Gus vows to destroy the Salamanca family and in particular to humiliate Hector and prolong and draw out his suffering. In the first part of the fifth season, it is explained that Mike Omantraut's intentions for being in this business were to provide for his granddaughter's future, and by his final episode he is conflicted when having to leave her in a park by herself once he has been warned that the police are onto him. During the second part of the fifth season, white supremacist Jack Welker says don't skimp on family, and he lets Walt live after capturing him in the desert because of love for his nephew Todd Alquist, who has great respect for Walt. Lydia Rhoda Quayle repeatedly demands that if Mike insists on killing her, that he leave her in her apartment so her daughter can find her, fearful she will think Lydia abandoned her. Much like Walt and Mike, Lydia seems to engage in the meth business in order to provide for her daughter, with actress Laura Fraser stating in an interview that Lydia's daughter is important to how Lydia justified what she did to herself. Chapter 5 Section 3 Pride Pride slash hubris is a major theme in Walter White's tragic character arc. In an interview with The Village Voice, showrunner Vince Gilligan identified the tipping point at which Walt breaks bad as his prideful decision not to accept Gretchen and Elliot Schwartz's offer to pay for his chemotherapy. They offer everything he needs. At the end of that hour he says, Thank you, no, 
and he goes back to Jesse Pinkman and says, let's cook. And that was where the character truly got interesting for me. This guy's got some serious pride issues. A Looper article identified pride as Walt's fatal flaw. Motivated by pride, he makes a series of decisions that keep him in the meth industry and eventually lead to his downfall. For example, at a family dinner when Hank discusses his admiration for Gail Bettica's criminal brilliance and suggests that Gail was Heisenberg, Walt replies, to my eye, all this brilliance looks like nothing more than just simple rote copying, probably of someone else's work. Believe me, I have been around enough students to know. So, this genius of yours, maybe he's still out there. Skylar notes with frustration that if not for Walt's prideful remarks, Hank might have stopped investigating. Finally, the critically acclaimed episode Ozymandias references the Percy Bysshe Shelley poem of the same name, which describes the crumbling legacy of an overly prideful king. The episode draws parallels to the poem, as both anti-heroes are left with little to show for their empire-building efforts. Austin Gill of Xavier University stated the episode evokes the tyrannical aspirations of invincibility and arrogance of Ozymandias himself as represented in Shelley's poem. Douglas Eric Rasmussen of the University of Saskatchewan argued that the concept of hubris and being punished for grandiose projects that serve an individual's egotism are central aspects of the each work. Hank's death marks the beginning of a shift where it becomes increasingly difficult for Walt to continue to insist that he cooks meth, for the sake of his family's well-being. By the series finale, Walt finally admits to Skylar that he became Heisenberg for his own ego. I did it for me. I liked it. I was good at it. Chapter 6, Symbols Chapter 6, Section 1, Pink Teddy Bear A motif within the second season is the image of a damaged teddy bear and its missing eye. The teddy bear first appears at the end of the music video Fallacies for Jesse's band Port Hammer, which was released as a webisode in February 2000, and nine leading to the second season. The teddy bear can also be spotted on the mural on Jane's bedroom wall during the final episode of the second season, further connecting the crash to Jane. It is seen in flash-forwards during four episodes, the titles of which, when put together in order, form the sentence 737 down over ABQ the flash-forwards are shot in black and white, with the sole exception of the pink teddy bear, which is an homage to the film Schindler's List, where the color red is used to distinguish the coat of a very young girl. At the end of the season, Walter indirectly helps cause the mid-air collision of two airplanes, the pink teddy bear is then revealed to have fallen out of one of the planes and into the White's swimming pool. Vince Gilligan called the plane accident an attempt to visualize all the terrible grief that Walt has wrought upon his loved ones and the judgment of God. In the first episode of the third season, Walt finds the teddy bear's missing eye in the pool skimmer. Television critic Miles McNutt has called it a symbol of the damage feels responsible for, and the AV Club commented that the pink teddy bear continues to accuse. Fans and critics have compared the appearance of the teddy bear's face to an image of Gus Fring's face in the fourth season finale. The teddy bear prop was auctioned off, among other memorabilia, on September 29, 2013 the air date of the show finale. Chapter 6, Section 2, Colors A reoccurring symbol within Breaking Bad is the use of color, particularly the character's color for wardrobe, being used to represent a character's state of mind, a relationship between characters, or foreshadow an event. In an interview with Vulture, Vince Gilligan says color is important on Breaking Bad, we always try to think in terms of it. We always try to think of the color that a character is dressed in, in the sense that it represents on some level their state of mind. Chapter 6 Section 3 Walt Whitman Walter White's name is reminiscent of the poet Walt Whitman. During the series, Gail Vetica gives Walt a copy of Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Prior to giving this gift, Vetica recites when I heard the learned astronomer. In the episode Bullet Points, Hank finds the initials WW written in Betica's notes, and jokes with Walt that they are his initials, 
although Walt indicates that they must refer to Whitman. In the episode Hazard Pay, Walt finds the copy of Leaves of Grass as he is packing up his bedroom, briefly smiles and leaves it out to read. This occurs at an especially high point in his life, where he feels that things are coming together and he is succeeding in all his ventures. A poem in the book, Song of Myself, is based on many of these same feelings, furthering the connection between Walt's life and Whitman's poetry. The mid-season finale of season 5, Gliding Over All, is titled after poem 271 of Leaves of Grass. In the episode, Hank finds leaves of grass in Walt's bathroom and opens it to the cover page, where he reads the handwritten inscription, To my other favorite WW it's an honor working with you. Fondly GB upon reading this, Hank becomes visibly shocked, realizing the truth about Walter for the first time, which provides the opening premise for the second half of the final season. Chapter 7, Reception and Legacy Chapter 7 Section 1 critical reception. Breaking Bad received widespread critical acclaim and has been praised by many critics as one of the greatest television shows of all time. On the review aggregator website Metacritic, the first season scored 73, the second 84, the third 89, the fourth 96, and the fifth 99. The American Film Institute listed Breaking Bad as one of the top 10 television series of 2008, 2010, 2011, 2012 and 2013. In 2013, TV Guide ranked it as the ninth greatest TV series of all time. By its end, the series was among the most watched cable shows on American television, with audience numbers doubling from the fourth season to the fifth. A 2015 survey by The Hollywood Reporter of 2,800 actors, producers, directors, and other industry people named Breaking Bad as their number two favorite show. In 2016, Rolling Stone ranked it third on its list of 100 greatest TV shows of all time. In September 2019, The Guardian ranked the show third on its list of the 100 best TV shows of the 21st century, describing it as the show that arguably killed off the anti-hero drama, nothing since has been able to top the depraved descent made by Walter White, from milquetoast chemistry teacher to meth overlord, and few have dared to try. In 2021, Empire ranked Breaking Bad at number one on their list of the 100 greatest TV shows of all time. Alan St. John of Forbes called it the best TV show ever. In 2021, it was voted the third best TV series of the 21st century by the BBC, as picked by 206 TV experts from around the world. For the first season, the series saw a generally positive reception. New York Post critic Linda Stassi praised the series, particularly the acting of Cranston and Paul, stating Cranston and Paul are so good, it's astounding. I'd say the two have created great chemistry, but I'm ashamed to say such a cheap thing. Robert Bianco of USA Today also praised Cranston and Paul, exclaiming there is humor in the show, mostly in Walt's efforts to impose scholarly logic on the business and on his idiot apprentice, a role Paul plays very well. But even their scenes lean toward the suspenseful, as the duo learns that killing someone, even in self-defense, is ugly, messy work. The second season saw critical acclaim. Entertainment Weekly critic Ken Tucker stated Bad is a superlatively fresh metaphor for a middle-age crisis, it took cancer and law-breaking to jolt Walt out of his suburban stupor, to experience life again, to take chances, risk danger, do things he didn't think himself capable of doing. None of this would work, of course, without Emmy winner Cranston's ferocious, funny selflessness as an actor. For all its bleakness and darkness, there's a glowing exhilaration about this series, it's a feel-good show about feeling really bad. San Francisco Chronicle's Tim Goodman claimed the first three episodes of season two that AMC sent out continue that level of achievement with no evident missteps. In fact, it looks as if Gilligan's bold vision for Breaking Bad, now duly rewarded against all odds, has invigorated everyone involved in the project. You can sense its maturity and rising ambition in each episode. Horror novelist Stephen King lauded the series, 
comparing it to the likes of Twin Peaks and Blue Velvet. The third season also saw critical acclaim. Time proclaimed, it's a drama that has chosen the slow burner over the flashy explosion, and it's all the hotter for that choice, Newsday stated Breaking Bad was still TV's best series and it stayed true to itself. Tim Goodman praised the writing, acting, and cinematography, pointing out the visual adventurousness of the series. Goodman went on to call the show's visuals a combination of staggering beauty, the directors make use of numerous wide-angle landscape portraits, and transfixing weirdness. After the finale aired, the AV Club said that season 3 was one of television's finest dramatic accomplishments. And what makes it so exciting, what makes the recognition of the current golden age so pressing, is that the season has not been, as put it in another context, television good. The heart-in-the-throat quality of this season comes as much from the writer's exhilarating disregard for television conventions as from the events portrayed. Season 4 won near-universal critical acclaim. The Boston Globe referred to the show as a taut exercise in withheld disaster and declared the show riveting. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette labeled the series smart and thought-provoking that elevates the artistic achievements of the medium. Season 4 was listed by many critics as one of the best seasons of television in 2011. Time listed Walter White's I Am The One Who Knocks line as one of the best television lines of 2011. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette listed it as the best series of 2011 while noting that Breaking Bad is that rare TV series that has never made a seriously damaging storytelling misstep. The AV Club's review of the finale summed it up as a fantastically fitting end for a season that ran in slow motion, starting and continuing with so many crises begging for resolution week after week. Now the decks are cleared, but that doesn't mean anybody is home free. Nothing's ever easy on Breaking Bad. The reviewer continued to exalt the season, and proclaimed, what a season of television, truly something none of us could ever have expected, or claimed we deserved. Both halves of the fifth season received overwhelming critical acclaim. Following the end of the series, critic Nick Harley summarized his commendation of the show, expertly written, virtuosic with its direction, and flawlessly performed, Breaking Bad is everything you could want in a drama. Critics will spend the next decade dissecting and arguing about what made it great, but the reasons are endless and already well documented. During the final season, the show also received praise from George R. R. Martin, author of the A Song of Ice and Fire novels, particularly the episode Ozymandias, Martin commented that Walter White is a bigger monster than anyone in Westeros. In his review of the second half of season 5, Seth Amatin of IGN stated, This final batch of Breaking Bad is one of the best run of episodes TV has ever offered, and praised Ozymandias in particular, referring to it as maybe the best episode of TV ever seen. Jonah Goldberg of National Review called it the best show currently on television, and perhaps even the best ever. The veteran actor Sir Anthony Hopkins wrote a letter of praise to Brian Cranston, telling him that his performance as Walter White was the best acting I have seen, ever. He lauded the rest of the cast and crew as well. The letter first appeared on Stephen Michael Quezada's Facebook page, and in spite of it being taken down, the letter soon went viral. In 2013, Guinness World Records named Breaking Bad the highest-rated TV series of all time, citing its Season 5 Metacritic score of 99 out of 100. Chapter 7 Section 2 – Criticism Breaking Bad has been accused by some members of law enforcement and the legal community of normalizing or glorifying methamphetamine creation and usage. Chapter 7 Section 3 – Viewership Breaking Bad premiered on the same night as both the NFC and AFC championships in the 2008 NFL playoffs, an intentional decision by AMC hoping to capture the adult male viewership immediately following the planned end of the NFC game. However, the game ran over its time slot, cutting into Breaking Bad's time slot in most of America. As a result, the pilot had only about 1.4 million viewers. Coupled with the ongoing writer's strike, the first season did not draw as large of a viewership as they expected. However, 
with subsequent seasons, viewership increased, avoiding the usual trend of downward viewership that most serialized shows had. Ratings further increased by the fourth season as, prior to airing, the previous seasons had been added to Netflix, boosting interest in the show. Breaking Bad is considered the first such show to have a renewed burst of interest due to the show being made available on Netflix. The second half of the final season saw record viewership, with the series finale reaching over 10.3 million viewers. Viewership data for Season 2 Episode 7, 9, 10, 11, and 12 is unavailable. Chapter 7 Section 4, Awards and Nominations The series received numerous awards and nominations, including 16 Primetime Emmy Awards and 58 nominations, including winning for Outstanding Drama Series in 2013 and 2014. It also won two Peabody Awards, one in 2008 and one in 2013. For his portrayal of Walter White, Brian Cranston won the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series four times, in 2008, 2009, 2010, and 2014. Cranston also won the TCA Award for Individual Achievement in Drama in 2009 and the Satellite Award for Best Actor, Television Series, Drama in 2008, 2009, and 2010, as well as the Critics' Choice Television Award for Best Actor in a Drama Series and the Saturn Award for Best Actor on Television in 2012. Aaron Paul won the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Drama Series in 2010, 2012, and 2014. Paul also won the Saturn Award for Best Supporting Actor on Television in 2010 and 2012. Anna Gunn won the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Drama Series in 2013 and 2014. For his work on Season 4, Giancarlo Esposito won the Critics' Choice Television Award for Best Supporting Actor in a Drama Series. In 2010 and 2012, Breaking Bad won the TCA Award for Outstanding Achievement in Drama, as well as the TCA Award for Program of the Year in 2013. In 2009 and 2010, the series won the Satellite Award for Best Television Series, Drama, along with the Saturn Award for Best Syndicated-slash-Cable Television Series in 2010, 2011, and 2012. The series won the Writers Guild of America Award for Television, Dramatic Series in both 2012 and 2013. In 2013, it was named number 13 in a list of the 101 Best Written TV Series of All Time by the Writers Guild of America and won, for the first time, the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Drama Series. Overall, the show has won 110 industry awards and been nominated for 262. Chapter 8 Retrospective Conversations Chapter 8 Section 1 Writer's Reunion Variety held a Q&A with most of the original writing staff to reflect on the show's run, the final season, the writing process and alternative endings. Along with creator Vince Gilligan, fellow writers and producers Peter Gould, Thomas Schnauz, Jennifer Hutchison, Moira Wally Beckett, Sam Catlin and George Masters joined to discuss memories from the show's humble beginnings, character transformations that concluded in the final season as well as surprising developments along the way. For instance, the character of Jesse Pinkman was originally supposed to die halfway through season one in a tragic drug deal gone horribly wrong. The reasoning behind this decision was that Jesse served his purpose in a meat and potatoes, logistical sense. The character would give Walt his entree into the business before meeting his demise. However, this was eventually done away with as the story progressed beyond Gilligan's early scripts. The writers also opened up on their collaborative process and how their form of storytelling evolved with the show. According to writer George Mastras, screen time was precious, and infusing every moment with the emotion, not just forming the pieces of the puzzle to tell the story, which is hard enough. If you're going to take five seconds of screen time, you'd better damn well be sure that there's an emotion there. It may be very, very subtle, but trust the audiences to pick up on that, because audiences do. 
The development of certain characters posed challenges. Skylar White became unsympathetic to most viewers in earlier seasons as she was often presented as an obstacle to Walt's ultimate agenda. The writers struggled to change the dynamic and realized that the only way people were going to like Skylar was if she started going along with what Walt was doing. It was a tricky shift to alter on screen because they didn't want to betray her character so they justified the change by using her past job as a bookkeeper to segue into her helping Walt money launder his cash under the guise of a car wash. Breaking the individual episodes was another form of problem solving for the writers. They stressed the importance of not letting the master plan stop them from staying true to the world they created. There came a point where tracking the characters on a moment-by-moment -moment basis proved to be more useful rather than general direction of the story. Peter Gould said they would always start with the last thought in a character's head. Where's Jesse's head at? That was always the prelude to the breakthrough moment, because when you said that, it's usually because we had gotten attached to some big plan or some big set piece that we thought had to be there, but the characters didn't want to do what we wanted them to do. Chapter 8 Section 2, Ryan Johnson's Experience on the Show Director Ryan Johnson worked on three episodes and in an interview with IGN shared his memories from behind the camera. He shed some light on the process including the fact that he sat through tone meetings with Vince Gilligan. The two of them talked about every dramatic beat in a script, the distinct visual look of the show and how the tonal shift of each scene had to feel natural while serving the main storyline of the particular episode. Johnson also revealed that he learned so much about working with actors because of his directing of Brian Cranston and Aaron Paul, describing the experience as a free masterclass. When asked about the show's lasting legacy, Johnson offered up his thoughts. I think the seriousness and depth with which it took its characters is the thing that really makes it stand apart for me. And that's where the power of it comes from. Obviously, starting with Walter White, there's just very few stories that are told on that scale, that have a character who is that deeply considered at the center of it. And I've heard people describe it as Shakespearean, and I know that word gets tossed around a lot, but I think in this case it really does apply. And that speaks, not so much to the fact that he goes to a dark place, but the fact that his entire journey is so deeply resonant, because it's so deeply considered. Chapter 9, Spin-Offs and Adaptations Chapter 9 Section 1, Metastasis On March 13, 2013, after several days of speculation fueled by Univision, Sony confirmed that it would be making a Spanish-language remake of Breaking Bad titled Metastasis starring Diego Trujillo as Walter Blanco and Roberto Urbina as José Miguel Rosas, alongside Sandra Reyes and Julian Arango in unnamed roles. On October 2, 2013, the cast list was revealed to include Reyes as Cielo Blanco and Arango as Henry Navarro, and that the show would be set in Colombia. The equivalent of Saul Goodman is named Saul Bueno. Chapter 9 Section 2, Better Call Saul Bob Odenkirk's character of Saul Goodman was originally to appear in Breaking Bad in three episodes within the show's second season, but became a main character through the rest of the show's run in part due to the strength of Odenkirk's acting abilities. Goodman became one of the show's more popular characters, and Odenkirk, Gilligan, and Peter Gould, who wrote the episode Better Call Saul in which the character was introduced, started discussions near the end of Breaking Bad of a possible series expanding on the character, eventually settling on the idea of a prequel to show the origins of Saul about six years prior to the events of Breaking Bad. In April 2013, AMC and Sony Pictures Television expressed interest in Gilligan and Gould's spin-off series concept, and they officially ordered Better Call Saul in September 2013. The series focuses on Saul's life six years before he became Walter's lawyer as Jimmy McGill, a more earnest lawyer trying to turn away from his troublesome conman days. In addition to Odenkirk, Banks and Esposito star and reprise their roles as Mike and Gus, respectively, while several other Breaking Bad cast of guests starred on the show. Newcomers to the starring cast of Better Call Saul include Rhea Seahorn, Patrick Fabian, Michael Mando, 
Michael McKean, and Tony Dalton. The show premiered on February 8, 2015, and as of April 2020, finished airing its fifth season, with a sixth and final season scheduled to premiere in 2022 to complete a 63-episode run. Better Call Saul has received similar critical praise as Breaking Bad, and was considered as a prime example of how to produce a spin-off work that defies the usual expectations of such forms. Chapter 9 Section 3, Talking Bad From August 11, 2013, to September 29, 2013, eight episodes of the live talk show, Talking Bad, aired on AMC, following Breaking Bad. The host, Chris Hardwick, and guests, who included celebrity fans, cast members, and Breaking Bad crew members, discussed episodes that aired immediately preceding the talk show. Talking Bad was inspired by the success of Talking Dead, which airs immediately following new episodes of The Walking Dead, and the talk shows share a similar logo and theme music. Chapter 9 Section 4, Breaking Bad, Criminal Elements on June 6, 2019, FTX Games released Breaking Bad, Criminal Elements, a strategy mobile video game for both iOS and Android. The game contains many elements of the original show and focuses mainly on the player building his own drug empire from nothing, similar to how Walt did in the show. The game closed in September 2020. Chapter 9 Section 5, The Broken and the Bat in June 2020, AMC announced a six-part true crime docuseries inspired by Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul titled The Broken and the Bad. It is hosted by Giancarlo Esposito and premiered on the AMC app and AMC. Com on July 9, 2020. Chapter 9 Section 6, Fan Edit Film In 2017, French editors Lucas Stoll and Gail Olmerestin created a fan edit, simply titled Breaking Bad, the movie, condensing the entire series into a two-hour feature film and uploaded it onto Vimeo. They had worked on the film for around two years prior to its release. However the film was soon taken down for copyright violation. Critic Alan Sepinwar remarked that the movie doesn't in any way work as a standalone entity. In order to achieve feature film length, notable side characters like Tuco Salamanca, and the Salamanca cousins were cut entirely, and the conclusion to the Gustavo Fring story occurred off-screen. Chapter 9 Section 7, Sequel Feature Film Rumors of a Breaking Bad film, under the working title Greenbrier, had arisen beginning in 2018. The film was formally announced in February 2019, and was later revealed to be named El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie. The film was released exclusively on Netflix on October 11, 2019, and was broadcast on AMC on February 16, 2020. The film stars Paul reprising his role as Jesse, following the events of the series finale Felina, as the character searches for his freedom. Chapter 10, Real Life Influence Chapter 10 Section 1, Cult Following In 2015, Series creator Vince Gilligan publicly requested fans of the series to stop reenacting a scene from Caballo Sin Nombre, in which Walter angrily throws a pizza onto his own roof after Skylar refuses to let him inside, this came after complaints from the home's real-life owner. Cranston reprised his role of the character in a commercial for Esurance which aired during Super Bowl XLIX, one week before the premiere of Breaking Bad spin-off Better Call Saul. Chapter 10 Section 2, Walter White Obituary and Funeral A Breaking Bad fan group placed a paid obituary for Walter White in the Albuquerque Journal, October 4, 2013. On October 19, 2013, a mock funeral procession and service for the character was held at Albuquerque's Sunset Memorial Park Cemetery. A headstone was placed with a photo of Cranston as Walter. While some residents were unhappy with the makeshift gravesite for closure with the show, tickets for the event raised nearly $17,000 for a local charity called Healthcare for the Homeless. Chapter 10 Section 3, New Mexico Law Review In May 2015, 
The New Mexico Law Review published a collection of eight articles by legal scholars, each dedicated to dissecting legal issues presented by Breaking Bad. The articles discussed issues such as whether the attorney-client privilege would protect communications with Saul Goodman, and whether Walter White could have filed a lawsuit to force his way back into gray matter technologies. Chapter 10 Section 4 Others Several attempts to create a real restaurant concept after Los Polos Hermanos have occurred, most notably in 2019, Family Style Incorporated, a chain of restaurants in California, Nevada, and Illinois, which secured rights from Sony and with Gilligan's blessing to sell chicken dinners through Uber Eats under the name and branding Los Polos Hermanos in a three-year deal. Law enforcement authorities have reported occasional instances of seizing blue crystal methamphetamine in drug-related arrests and raids. The appearance of blue meth in real-world drug use has been attributed to Breaking Bad's popularity.